What's up, everyone? Welcome back to the Cinema Center at Marble at TIFF 2023. I have the pleasure of talking with Christy Hall, the filmmaker behind daddy My God, congratulations. First feature as a director, and this is a hugely ambitious project here. Yes, I'm so glad you you think so. Thanks for watching it and for having me. Okay, before I get into filmmaking specifics, I have like a couple of silly personal questions. I can't just wait. because like I, <laughs> I, I I'm a New Yorker. I was telling you I've had memorable moments in cabs. So for you personally, can you share a memorable cab experience or maybe even just a memorable encounter you've had with a stranger that stuck with you? Oh, I mean, I, I could rattle on and on. I anyone who spent much time in New York has gotten in a cab and engaged with a cabbie just like Sean Penn's character. It's just a very specific person that only a place like New York City can provide. And it's uh, it's kind of my love letter to to all the, the cabbies, the quintessential cabbies of New York City. Um, and yes, I've had endless profound uh, lively conversations with perfect strangers or imperfect strangers, I should say. <laughs> Really all over New York and all over the world. So it's I, I feel like we're losing the art of what it means to just talk to each other, especially talking to someone who maybe doesn't see the world exactly the way that you do. And so, uh, yeah, the movie is just kind of getting in there and getting under the, the hood of, of what that can feel like. His line in particular about her not looking at her phone as much has, has been basically ingrained in my brain ever since I've seen the film. And now every, sadly, not cab, but Uber I get into, I'm always thinking, like, should I be sitting there with that thing right in my face, blocking my view or put it down? I, I That's kind of the spirit of this film is it's, you know, it's an exploration of what could happen if we really decide to, yeah, put our phone down and actually engage with the world. Because if you talk to someone long enough, uh, they will reveal their humanity to you. And I think that that reminds us that we're all very infinitely connected. And I think that's kind of the medicine that we need right now. I had one more sillier question, just because his plant in his car yes. really stuck out to yes. me. Yes. For, for you, what is like the most random thing you have in your car or just like a personal touch that you put on it that makes it purely you? Oh, I, I'm so glad you highlighted the plant. Um, just a fun fact, it's a money plant. A money so, plan. Yeah, so you know how he goes on and on about the credit cards and money and all the stuff, and he, and so it's a it's a money plant that he's watering each day for good fortune. It's just a, it's a, just a fun little Easter egg. I love that. Um, now I want a money plant in my car. <laughs> I know. As I'm talking, I'm like, I think I need to put a plant in my car. <laughs> I think LA could handle it. Like a little succulent can handle it. I think. <laughs> I'm not good with plants. I don't trust myself. So what is what's your version of the plan? Do you have something? Oh, like what plants do I love? No, or? like something in your car. Oh, in my it's car. I okay. So probably the 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 cutest thing I probably have in my. I have a puppy. Her name is Monty, and um, I've got a little dog hammock in the back seat so that when I you know, drive around. She she just is like cradled in the back and it's really cute. Very risky to bring that up. And I veer down the puppy path and yeah, yeah, not yeah, yeah. about your movie. Yeah, we just start talking about puppies. <laughs> movie, movie talk right now. So I know this idea originally started as a play. Do yeah. you remember the moment or specific thing that signaled to you this story is best served in the feature film format instead? It happened very organically. I think this would have been beautiful on stage. You know, I wanted to do a theater in the round black box and, and then have the, the cab slightly turning. So at, and you don't notice it at first, but that wherever you're sitting, you get to see him from her perspective or vice versa. And that's kind of the thematics of the, the front seat, back seat, but, you know, part of the spirit of the of the film. Uh, so I think it would have played really beautifully on stage. Um, but I will say it was just it was very organic the way that it happened. And uh, I, I'm so excited that it's a movie because we can get really granular and we can really get up close and personal and it invites an intimacy uh, that any character driven chamber piece, it's like it's the power of the piece. So I'm really glad we can really get in there. I mean, now that I've seen the movie, though, I still want more. So maybe a stage edition is something that the future could hold. I will say my cast is not opposed to it. You know, uh, Sean, when he read the piece, he said this made me want to be on stage again. So I'm not going to say 
No. I love that idea so, so much. All right, I want to talk about getting this off the ground because not only is it an ambitious film, but also a first-time feature filmmaker, making a movie like that is an absolute feat. So when you first decided you wanted to make the movie, what did you think was step one to getting yourself a green light? And now having done it, would you give another aspiring filmmaker that tip or did you find something more effective along the way? Uh, That's an excellent question. I feel like success in this industry is a moving target. It's not a perfect science, so you kind of have to trust yourself and trust that your the partners will arrive and you know I I it wasn't necessarily a checklist it's more of a leap of faith so uh, this script landed on the lap of Emma Tillinger Koskoff who's an incredible producer Irishman Joker uh, the list goes on and on it landed on the lap of Roe Donnelly and Dakota Johnson who are producing partners and they were like, not only do we want to join you uh, as producers, but Dakota wants to be the woman in the back seat. And then music to my ears, Dakota said, do you mind if I slip the script to my good old friend, Sean Penn? And I just said, well, we would be so lucky. He read wi- right away. And once once cast was solidified, that made it easier to find uh, financing. But I just have to say to any, all you storytellers out there, it, it like just, you know, do the work and write from your heart, create from your heart, and just really trust that the people who, uh, the people who are meant to champion you, they will, they will arrive, and they'll arrive right on time, even if it takes longer than you than you thought. <laughs> this is why I love coming to film festivals and doing interviews. I feel like I hear that elsewhere as well, but yeah. on these particular days, it's just being like showered in those sentiments, and in a time where I really need my like film loving heart filled essentially yeah. that's what's happening here and you yeah. need that mentality or you can't do it yeah. i want to go back to your cast two questions about that because sean is also a producer on the film right uh yeah, pro- yes. projected picture works is uh, yes yes so when you are working with two leads who are also producing do you notice any kind of change in the collaboration given that they have that added involvement in the production overall um it actually just makes it feel like a, a real, like a family. It, it feels everyone has taken such ownership of it. I feel like when you're when you're going to be in front of the camera and then you're also really integral behind the camera as well. So I just honestly just felt so endlessly protected by them. And, you know, there was no improvising in this film. Like, they really delivered the play. Uh, Because they're both theater people. You know, Sean's been on Broadway. He worked with Sam Shepard for many years, um, originating a lot of his work in San Francisco. Dakota did theater before she became... Her, the glorious movie star that she is. So it's like they we just kind of treated it like a play and they really they're word perfect. And so on screen and off screen, they just look, I this being my first feature, like I've raised my hand for a few of my scripts and I a lot of times was told no. So I really needed people to surround me and and Sean and Dakota they they put their faith in me. They put their faith in this script and they said, no, Christy's the one to direct this and we are going to we're going to help her push this boulder up the mountain. One of my favorite things in the world is hearing about very well-known actors with big platforms using those platforms mm. to support films that maybe That's wouldn't it. get made otherwise. That's and right. the more I hear about that, the better. I want to know about your collaboration with them as an actor's director. Clearly, they are pros. They have wonderful chemistry together. But can you maybe specify something about each of their process that is unique to them and maybe calls for something different from you as an actor's director? Yeah, so um, I feel like they took just such incredible ownership of these characters. And so, uh, you know, Sean um, really wanted to rehearse. And so, because I think that's part of his process. So it, it was really fun. He invited Dakota and I to his house. And so we did table work like you do in theater. You kind of read through it. You talk about the intention of each moment, the emotion and all of it. And then it was like, great, let's kind of get it up on its feet a little bit. We didn't want to over rehearse, but it was fun. We talked about how the fact that most of their performance, they are connecting in the rear view mirror and not necessarily face to face. So Sean was like, maybe we should get the feeling of what that would even be like. Like they're not across from each other. Their, their eye lines are up here right and so Sean in his living room set up a chair and like had a pole and put like a hand mirror and duct taped it to the pole and then had Dakota sitting behind him so they could kind of mark through the play just kind of connecting in the in the rear view mirror and it, or in you know the makeshift rear view mirror and it was that was really fun um, it was really important to both of them because you know they never have a costume change they're wearing one 
Yeah, they're just wearing yes. one thing the entire time. So I think it would feel really unfair to dictate to them what that was. So uh, obviously they, you know, they worked with our amazing costume designer to find their look, uh, but they both took a lot of ownership of what they're wearing. Um, uh, you know, Dakota, she really felt very passionate that her character had those beautiful nails, for example. So, um, yeah, I feel like they just they really sunk their teeth into it and uh, and really made it their own. And it was exciting to me because they never adulterated the the characters that are on the page. They just elevated them and just completely just, yeah, made them their own. You don't get better partners <laughs> than ones that are able to do something like yeah. that. Yeah. I have to get into how you film this movie. It fascinates me. How did you come to the conclusion that the best way to capture this material was, I believe, on a soundstage with the drive footage projected around them? That's correct. Yeah. So um, it's kind of it was just kind of a necessity, honestly. So um, trailering our cast, uh, we had 16 days to shoot. And we were sandwiched between Thanksgiving and the holidays, which is a big is a big busy time in New York. So the idea of trailering them in a cab with with grip gear and cameras hanging off the sides, like our ability to reset, um, we couldn't predict the weather, we couldn't predict anything. So that just felt really unfair to their performances, and we wouldn't be able to utilize all the precious time that we had. So then it was like, okay, we need to do it on a soundstage. But to use blue or green screen, I, it would look a little too inauthentic for my taste. And then also all that background would have had to be applied later, which would have cost a lot of money for our our special effects budget, our VFX budget, basically. So um, we're utilizing brand new technology. I think that we're the very first grounded drama to use this technology throughout the entire uh, film. Uh, Mandalorian uses this technology, a lot of really big budget movies, but I think that we're the first to prove that you can be cutting edge and it can actually be a huge gift if you have limited time and limited budget. So exactly, on, so everything interior in the cab is shot on a soundstage and people are really surprised to hear that. We surrounded the cab with these um, really high resolution LED panels and they're basically projecting the drive that we shot on an array car with nine cameras. So it's incredible, so the backdrop and then the foreground with the actors, it's all filtering in through the lens at the same time, so it looks real. And it looks beautiful. And we have these gorgeous anamorphic lenses that were detuned for like a vintage look. So it's like, just to have all of that, all that information be captured all at the same time, it allows it to just look just magical and beautiful. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm really proud and I feel like we're showing, a lot of people are afraid of this technology, but I feel like it is the wave of the future and I could geek out about it and talk about it too long, but that's at least a little bit. Well, I am <laughs> curious, what do you think it is that makes people afraid of this technology? And based on your experience, what would you tell them to make them not afraid of that particular well, thing? I mean Look, you can't, I mean, I believe in shooting organically and nature is wonderful. And when you can shoot on location, there's nothing better, right? But again, if you have constraints of budget and time, I just feel like it actually, it, it, it is honoring the beauty of nature just in a way that is a little bit more uh, conducive to, to, a, to a shooting schedule, right? So, I mean, just for example, like you could shoot a scene if, let's say I had an eight page sunrise scene of like mother daughter sitting on a porch talking to each other. You could shoot the sunrise and then play the sunrise back. You could shoot that scene in three days over the course of three days and the sunrise could be set and reset and the colors will look the same, the continuity. And it could also make young filmmakers, uh, it, give them the ability to hold on to scenes that maybe they couldn't have afforded if you only have the location for one day. Because they could be told, we only have this location for five hours, we can't chase the light, so maybe it's not a sunrise scene. Maybe it's something else. But I just think that you can utilize it to allow your vision to come through, and it's very cost effective. You just immediately took me back to film school where I can't even begin to tell you how many times I heard, don't set a scene during magic hour. It's a teeny tiny little gap. You're not going to be able to do it. So now with this technology, set all your scenes during magic <laughs> hour, and it's it's actually, and, and it looks really absolutely oh, stunning. If only I could go back in time to that program. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I am a New Yorker. Many New Yorkers will be watching this movie. Is there any particular part of recreating the drive from JFK to Hell's Kitchen that you were most worried about bringing to screen authentically where a New Yorker could watch it and know that like that's the real deal. That is how it happens. That's why we use this technology that 
ride is very distinctive and New Yorkers know that they know that drive very well. So I needed to be able to set and reset that backdrop because you know that when you first leave JFK, it's a little bit like this very cementy and industrial. And then when you exit the 495, it becomes more expansive and bright. And then as you're entering to the city and you see that uh, that that skyline like we we had to you know and new york the drive itself is like the silent third character of the film and we just had to get it right so look i'm a very stubborn new yorker and i just was like it has to feel real and so honestly again not to go back to the technology but it allowed us to honor each distinctive leg of the drive in real time and to be very intentional about every single detail that you see i appreciate that yeah. attention to detail yeah. there i have to let you go in a minute but i love asking uh this particular question so so I'm sure you had film, long-term filmmaking goals for yourself before making daddy -O, but now that you actually made it happen, it's a film that's going to come out and everyone's going to get to see and love. Is there any particular goal that you've had that's been enhanced or maybe that feels more within reach to you than ever because this film exists? Wow, that's a really beautiful question. Um, you know, I'm not done with the theater space. I, um, I'm i a playwright by trade. I Theater was my first love. I've always wanted to do film and television. Um, but, you know, as a playwright, until you've been on or off Broadway and made a huge splash in like a regional space like Steppenwolf, for example, a lot of people don't really know that you exist. So honestly, the success of daddy -O, if it does, if it also helps open doors for, look, I have a big library of material of straight plays and also musicals. Like if, if it allows me to t be taken just even that much more seriously in the theater space, um, I would love to continue to play in both realms. And, uh, but I would love to take this success back into the live theater space. So if anyone wants to put one of my plays on Broadway, please give me a call. I always <laughs> say in the Collider interviews, we like to manifest things, speak yeah. them into existence. Mm. So let's, let's not forget that. And okay, then maybe great. down the line, we'll do another interview for the play version. Congratulations on wait. this film. Thank to Everybody out there, keep an eye out for Daddy and stay tuned for more interviews from TIFF 2023 coming your way very, very soon.